beautiful voice. Beautiful voice. Uh, there's some people I don't think need a, a microphone or speakers. I think you have a voice that I think the United States can hear. That You've got a set of lungs. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Has this not been an amazing church service so far today? I praise God for the opportunity that we've been given to come and worship freely uh, here in, in York, Pennsylvania. And in the United States, uh, you think of some of the uh, things other people are going through uh, around the world. Uh, but yet we come here almost, dare I say, oblivious to the hardships that other people face. We have our hardships, don't get me wrong. We are going through it. Uh, but sometimes I think uh, what we go through pales in comparison uh, to what people go through across the Pacific and the Atlantic. That, those two bodies of water, I think, uh, are, are kind of a, a wall to blind us sometimes as to what other people are dealing with on a day-in and day-out basis. And my prayer is that uh, God would give us a heart that empathizes, not sympathizes, but empathizes, that we would, that we would mourn with our brothers and sisters. Paul said, pray for those who are in jail. Pray for me. Remember me as I'm in prison because I wear these chains for Jesus. Uh, I wear them for Jesus. And so my prayer is that we would identify and lift up our brothers and sisters around the world who are going through uh, great trials, not just spiritual, but real tangible physical trials around the world. I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, into our sermon for the day. And I just want to start by just telling about my family. Uh, yesterday was my son's birthday, December 4. He was actually born on a Friday. So yesterday is kind of, it's kind of interesting how this all worked out. Uh, I pray for all my sermon series, and so I don't always uh, know how it sometimes lines up. And so when I, uh, when I preach, sometimes I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this couldn't have happened any better. I couldn't have planned it any better than, uh, than God sometimes. God always plans it. So my son Jude was born on a Friday night at 7.45, December 4. My wife went into labor on December 2 uh, at about 5 o'clock on a Wednesday evening. And my wife was in labor for about 52 hours. Uh, that is uh, her badge of honor, I guess you could say. That is uh, that definitely, in my eyes, uh, she is stronger than I am. I would not have endured. No, I, don't, I can't even put a time, time frame on, on that. Uh, I wouldn't have endured. I wouldn't even endure the thought of it. It brings me to tears and makes me break down to a sweat. We went in on Wednesday evening, and it was, it was perfect because, well, I should say his, her, his due date was perfect because it was supposed to happen over my Thanksgiving break at the seminary. And so it was going to be, oh, it was going to be ideal. I'd be on break. I wouldn't have school. I could go to the hospital. I could be there with my wife, and, and my classes wouldn't get in the way. Um, nothing would get in the way. And it didn't happen that way. She went past her due date. And so December 2 actually happened. It was finals week. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I've got to take tests. How am I going to do this? So I called up my professors, and I said, listen, I said, my wife is in labor right now. They said, don't worry about it. You don't have to take the test. Uh, you can keep the grade you have. And immediately I thought, I should have had these babies coming out every six months around final. I don't care if it's nine months. Every six months, we need to be having these things out because this is working out perfectly. I don't even have to take my test. This is ideal. And so I was, I was praising God that I did not have to go to take my test. But we were in there for 52 hours. Now, we told everybody, as normally everybody does, when they're going into labor, they call their family, hey, we're headed to the hospital, we're going into labor just a little bit longer, and the baby's going to come out. Well, it wasn't a little bit longer for us. We went to a, uh, we did birthing class, and my wife and I uh, made a commitment that she was not going to take any drugs during her, her birth. And so uh, she said, Morgan, no matter what I say, or no matter what nurse, whatever a nurse says or a doctor says, I don't want any drugs. Don't let me have them. I said, okay, we can do that. She didn't want an epidural. She didn't want anything. And so that's kind of a decision that we made. And so when we get in there, it's one thing. She never looked at me and said, give me drugs. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I look, when you look on television and you see uh, these scenes on sitcoms or in movies of women going into labor, they're usually being wheeled on a gurney through the hospital, screaming at the top of their lungs with sweat coming down their face. They're usually yelling things at the, at the husband that's by their side, screaming, get away from me, you did this to me, you know, just with some of those comments. I couldn't have had a, my wife and I could not have had a more different birth experience. She did not scream, she did not yell, she did not cuss me, she did not say, you did this to me. It was 
She didn't make, she, she moaned because of the pain. She breathed the pain away. Uh, but the whole process, it wasn't until the very end that maybe she let out a noise and then Jude was born. And so 52 hours, my mom is going, just going crazy. She's worried to death. She's wondering uh, where, what kind of a hospital we're at that would allow us to go 52 hours. Are you, are you in the city? Are you out in the backwoods? I mean, what's going on here? She questioned all kinds of things. Don't worry. I said, don't call me. I'm not talking to you. We're focused. We're focused. And then I saw his head. And then midwife turned to me and says, would you like to deliver your son? I think every father should have the opportunity to deliver their children. As my hands held my son, yes, he looked borderline like a raisin. It's all this excess skin, all of this whatever, and I held him in my hands. Mine were the first hands to hold my son. And I took him over and I, I gave him to my wife. And she immediately calmed his crying down. I got to cut the umbilical cord. That sucker is tough. That is not paper. Cut the umbilical cord. And six years later, that was our 745 on a Friday night. On the sixth day of the week, God gave us a man. And we named him Jude. He was our Sabbath baby. To this day, he's our Sabbath baby. Every Sabbath, we think that, well, not every Sabbath, it kind of gets lost in track, but just because he was birthday was yesterday, we just, my wife and I both looked at our watches at 745 and we said, this is it. This is when Jude came in. He was already in bed and man alive. We went over to Don and Chris's house last night. And, uh, I just see him sitting next to Don and Thatcher's, Thatcher and Don, they sit next to, I'm sorry, Thatcher and Jude sit next to Don and Don's reading him Bible stories and I, I'm looking at Jude, I'm looking at his son. I'm thinking, this is mine. And he looks at me and for a minute, I don't know if he is intentionally looking at me or if he's just staring off into no man's land, but I realize he's, he is looking at me. And I just whisper across the room, I say, I love you. And he looks at me and he goes, I love you too. There is nothing like your children telling you that they love you. I don't want my kids to grow up. I want them to always look at me the way Jude looked at me last night. When my son Thatcher comes up and gives me a big hug, and I'll be honest with you, this is not to say that I love Jude more than Thatcher, but there is nothing like a firstborn. Whether it's a boy or a girl, there's nothing like a firstborn because you go from nothing to something. You go from, from, from husband and wife to mom and dad like this, like this. They're in your arms. You're holding them, and they call you mom. They call you dad, that bond, that relationship. The second one comes, and you've already had one, so it's a different kind of relationship. But that firstborn scenario impacts remembrance and memory that you have you'll never lose, and you should never lose it. We should always hold on to that moment when we became something we were not before. We should never forget that. The moment we were single, and now we are married. Now we are plural but one. The moment we were husband and wife, but the moment we became parents. The moment we became grandparents. The moment we became children of God Most High. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, is the moment we become. And what that means for Israel and their children, and what it means for us today. And I want you to open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 13, where our scripture was taken from. Exodus chapter 13. Bear with me for just a moment. Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, Then the Lord, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb, among the sons of Israel, both man and beast, it belongs to me. And before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and our minds. I pray that as, as we read through your word and as we see how it, how it affected the people in Bible times and throughout all of Bible history, that, God, you would show us also how it affects and applies to us today and to our future. 
God, come into our hearts. May your word come into our hearts. May you plant it deep down. May it take root and may it change. May it mold and shape us into the image of God. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Sanctify to me every firstborn. Sanctify. Set them aside. And why would God call Israel, why would God command that every firstborn from the womb, whether it is human or beast, be set aside, be sanctified, and belong to him. Well, in order to understand this, we have to understand where this is. It, where this is. The context is Exodus, is Exodus chapter 13. What's interesting about Exodus, especially the first 13, 14 chapters, is that you have action. Moses is born. Moses goes out. Moses comes back. Moses goes to Egypt. Then you have this plague, then you have this plague, then you have this plague, then you have this plague. It's almost as if you can't catch a breath. And then you come down to the final plague, which actually is more of a judgment and an act of worship. And we'll talk about that. It is the Passover, in which not only does God judge Egypt, he delivers Israel, and he says, now, tonight, be ready, we are leaving, we are walking out of here, nothing is stopping us. In fact, they're going to be throwing money at you as you walk out the door. The context is deliverance. The context is, is being freed from slavery, being freed from bondage, and being free, free to go do whatever I want. Because now I have a choice. Nothing is restricting me. Nothing is restraining me. So then because, and think of this, the Passover was instituted, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was instituted, now something else is instituted. The sacrifice, the ceremony of the firstborn son. Not daughter. You could have 52 daughters, and as long as that 53rd one's a boy, that's the one in effect. And the reason is because your son, not just any son, your firstborn was supposed to die. Supposed to die. But God provided a substitute. God provided a substitute. And that substitution was the lamb, the Passover lamb. So you have Passover, you have unleavened bread, and now you have the ceremony of the sacrifice of redeeming your firstborn. There are, those are three ceremonies, three feasts. The Passover feast, the feast of unleavened bread, and now this firstborn deal that all have their origins and roots and beginnings. Their genesis is in the Exodus account. So all these, these three major ceremonies, three monumental ceremonies, are intended for Israel to never forget what I did for you tonight. Never forget what I did for you tonight. So that means every time, you, every time someone gives birth to a firstborn son for the next 2,000 years, you know what they're supposed to remember? What I did for you tonight. Do you want to know why you can take your firstborn home? It's because I sent the firstborn to heaven so that you could take the firstborn home. The reason you can now hold your son and your neighbor can hold his son is because the Passover lamb took its place. We go back to Abraham and Isaac, and there couldn't be another, a better illustration of this, in which Abraham takes Isaac, and for years, and you may have heard this before, how this is some kind of analogy or symbolism of God and Jesus. And so how Abraham takes his son and places him up on the altar, and that's supposed to signify this interaction between God and Jesus that's on the cross. That couldn't be further from the truth. Because when you think about it, if we really believe Isaac represents Jesus, then Isaac should have died. But the problem is Isaac didn't die. Why didn't Isaac die? Because God provided a substitute. In fact, the Bible says he provided for himself a lamb. Or you can translate that, he provided for, provided a lamb himself. And so as Abraham looks over into the thicket, he sees this ram where its horns are caught in the thorns, just like Jesus has the crown of thorns on his head. And he takes this ram and he places it on the altar instead of Isaac. Do you realize all of us are on the altar unless we accept Jesus Christ and allow him to take our place? So the great substitute, while it may be signified in the Passover, has many, many threads, golden threads, running back even to the garden when Jesus, when God performs the first sacrifice and provides clothes for Adam and Eve with those skins, the animal skins. And so now for everybody, for, for the Hebrews here, for the Israelites, as they look at their firstborn, the immediate tangible example is this. You're alive because we put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. 
So because you're alive, because God provided a substitute, God says, you now belong to me. Think about this for a moment. The reason they, the firstborn, it didn't affect mom, it didn't affect dad, it didn't affect sister, it didn't affect anybody else in the family. The only person it affected was the firstborn. So because the firstborn was redeemed by the blood of the lamb, they now belong to God. Are you catching this? So the firstborn of Israel were called to be sanctified. Now we need to talk about sanctification for a moment. What does it mean to be sanctified? It means to be set apart for holy use, for a holy purpose. We talk at Seventh-day Adventists, we talk about how in Genesis, God created the seventh day. On the seventh day, God sanctified it, blessed it, he made it holy. We believe that God has taken the seventh day of the week and has spiritually sanctified it. He has set this day apart above all other days for a holy use and a holy purpose. And that has not changed. In the Bible, it never says that that designation or that, that description is ever removed from the seventh day. It is always a day to be used for a holy purpose and a holy use. And so when it talks about the firstborn, now they are designated for a holy purpose and a holy use. And what holy purpose and use would that be? To be ministers in Israel. They were called to be ministers. Think about this for a moment. When you go back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau, Jacob tried to steal Esau's birthright, but it wasn't just an inheritance of lambs and possessions. It was a spiritual birthright in which Isaac would bestow upon Esau the responsibility of being the minister, not just of his family, but of the whole company that went out with him. Abraham was the spiritual minister of his company. Isaac, the spiritual, and Jacob stole the spiritual. You cannot gain a spiritual birthright by lying or stealing or doing it yourself, ever. And that's why he wrestles with God. He never feels forgiven. And then finally, God changes his name and he receives. He knows he has the confidence of having that spiritual birthright. So then that means that if the firstborn, and this is the way it would work, you would take your son, your firstborn son, to the temple, and you would redeem it with a lamb. Now, Jesus would go to the temple, and they had sacrifices if you weren't wealthy enough to provide a lamb. There was other sacrifices you could alter. But a parent would take his son to the, to the temple, recognizing that the only reason I have this option is because another way was provided for my firstborn to live. You take it and you sacrifice it. You give it to the priest. The priest then takes it, holds it up before God, does, has the sacrifice, gives him back to you. In pagan religions, the son, the child, was sacrificed on the altar. But that's not what we believe, and that's not what God did, and God made that distinction with Abraham and, I, and, and Isaac. So now you get your son back because another way was provided for your firstborn to live. And then your son, prior, back here in Exodus, was then a, the spiritual leader. That would be bestowed upon him going forward. That means, oh, brothers and sisters, that means that mom and dad were raising their firstborn to, to pass the spiritual mantle on to them. Think about this. Are you raising your children to be spiritual leaders in your family? Are you raising your boys to be spiritual leaders in the church? Are you raising your daughters to be godly women in this world? When we look at the three services that God instituted in the heart of deliverance, it's a Passover lamb, it's unleavened bread, and it's your firstborn or mine. So that means I've redeemed you. Now I want your home to be an environment where the firstborn can be raised to be spiritual leaders. Let's talk to fathers for a minute. Where's your heart? Where's the father's heart? When we come to God as fathers, we are called to seek forgiveness, to seek cleansing. 
that we would be the fathers we need to be to raise the sons that this church and world need. And as fathers, when we go home today, is our family walking into an environment that is conducive to raising spiritual leaders? And am I facilitating that spiritual leadership and handing off of the baton? Am I handing off to my children a habit of watching television for three hours a night every night? Am I handing off to my children internet habits of, of playing video games or other online activities? When I was back at Leavenworth, or Kansas, Nebraska, when I was pastoring um, Lenexa and Leavenworth, Leavenworth is where the big, wow, federal penitentiary is, and that thing is cold-blooded up there if you've ever driven by it. The church at the time, there's a time where we didn't have an elder. And so I remember the first time, because sometimes I would take Jude with me uh, to church up there. It would just be me and him. I remember the first time we did communion together, and I sat down with my son. I think he was maybe, maybe three. I can't remember how old he was. And I washed my son's feet, and I explained to him what this meant. And then we went up into the church service, and like I said, I didn't have any elders. And so me and my son, that's my son sat on my right side as we ministered the communion service. So that would have been like he would have sat right here, right next to me. I've taken my son on visits and past just within the past week or so, I took uh, Jude Ann Thatcher to go visit. I think we went and visited Mary Limkeld and we went and visited Richard and Dolores. And the reason I do that is because I want visitation, I want ministry to be a part of their upbringing and the fabric of their lives. That it wouldn't be new to them, that it wouldn't be foreign to them, but that they would be used to growing up ministering, that they, we wouldn't be used to growing up going and doing all these other activities, whether it's going and buying things at Toys R Us or, or going and doing these other uh, fun activities. No, there needs to be a part where we put things of that nature on hold and say, first and foremost, we need to minister. And so I take them in. And we go visit. They're getting old enough now where they can, they can handle visitations like that. I've taken them to Hershey Hospital before. We visited uh, Jeff and Reva Seifert were up there. Are you taking your children to visit and minister to others? Is that a part of their upbringing right now in your home? I mean, think about this. When your children are at home, is it, is it ministry? Are you raising them? Because ultimately, when this child was redeemed, they belonged to God. They were set apart from every other child. They're brothers and sisters. In fact, there's still cultures over in the Middle East that the firstborn is designated, is given, is dedicated to religious pursuits, to minister into a priesthood. I mean, when we think about the, the remembrance of what God is actually doing here, I'm doing this, I'm wanting you to do this, because I have redeemed you. Now, this is how it applies to them. But throughout the ages, well, actually, just shortly, when they go, when Moses goes up and gets the Ten Commandments, it's in chapter 32, this whole series of, of things that happens while he's up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And I just want you to turn there for just a moment. Exodus, hold your finger here. In, in Exodus 13, but turn to Exodus 32. Moses comes down and sees that they have built, that Aaron ultimately, uh, as he investigates, has formed a golden calf. And all of these people have come up and they have com commanded, they have, they have uh, confronted Aaron and forced Aaron. He still had a choice, that's beside the point right now. But they finally Aaron made a golden calf. And Moses comes down and says, what? in the world is going on here. And so we look at verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. Whoever is for God, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. Do you realize who should have been the ones gathering to Moses in addition to Levi? All the firstborn of Israel. Do you realize what this means? At least this is, this, this is the conclusion I'm drawing. This means that 
families were not doing their job in raising their firstborn son to be spiritual leaders, not just in the home, but in all of Israel. So that means when the command goes out for God to call all of his people, whoever is for the Lord, come stand with me, your children should be the first person, people to get in line. Are we raising our children to be the first to get up and get in line to stand with Jesus Christ? Are we having worship with them in the home? Sundown worship. Are we bringing them to Sabbath school? Are we bringing them to church? Is it habitual for them to do spiritual things and be a part of spiritual activities? Because when the time comes, do you want your children in heaven? The children who are in heaven are the ones who stand with the Lord. So we need to be raising them as families, but also as a church. We need to be raising our children to stand with Jesus. No matter what conflict it may be, to always stand with Jesus, to always be fair, to be faithful, to be just. Because as time goes on, as a result of Levi, all of Levi coming and standing with Moses, God says, okay, no longer the firstborn, give me the tribe of Israel. They will be my priests. They will be my people. Because in Exodus chapter 19, God says, you will be a kingdom of priests. Be my holy nation. We think that's in 1 Peter, but no, he gets the roots are right before the law is given. This whole body of people will be a kingdom of priests. The only problem is it was only one tribe that got up and were priests and leaders for God, and that was Levi. So how does this affect us today? The reason the firstborn were redeemed, or the reason the firstborn were dedicated to God, was because the lamb took their place. So because the lamb took the place of the firstborn, the first, there is this exchanging, this interaction of, I'll give you the blood of the lamb in exchange for your firstborn. Now here's something very crucial here. This is not something where these firstborn are dragged, kicking, and screaming. I don't want to be with God. No, no, you're alive because of God. Are there days that you don't want to come to church? You may be here because a family member dragged you here today. When you go back and look at the Exodus experience, there was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. That means there were Egyptians or some other nationalities that put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. There are denominations today that say that the Jews have some kind of higher standing in God's eyes than the rest of everybody on the face of the earth. All Israel will be saved because they have a special place in God's heart. Here's the thing. That night of deliverance was not about being a Jew. It was about putting the blood of the, door, blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Because the Bible says back here in Genesis cha or Exodus chapter 12 that if you are not sacrificed or if you are not circumcised, you cannot partake of the Passover. Not if you're not a Jew, because it says no foreigner, but if you're circumcised. So there is a, God equates this circumcision with family. You want to know who my family are? My family are those who give their lives for me. You want to know why? Because not only have I given my life for them, I have delivered. Now, in case you think that keeping the Passover, that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and somehow offering my firstborn somehow find, gets me favor with God, I want you to pause that thought, and I want you to turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Some people are very scared of the Old Testament. But the problem is, the reason they're scared is because they don't understand it. You don't need to leave the first five books to get a great understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, in fact, oh my goodness, man, I was listening to this, this preacher, oh man, they had this little clip of him, and he got up and he said this. He was in, it was in reaction to what's going on with ISIS and, these, and the Muslims. He said, we believe in a God that does not call us to kill unbelievers. And distinctly, and it goes on to say, because we're a New Testament church. 
Now, this is not a sermon about all the people God has called Israel to lay waste to because we need to put time and effort into explaining that so we don't come away with a false impression of God being a dictator or a bloodthirsty God. But we have to take the whole Bible. We can't say that Jesus ushers in a, a new God. No, Jesus comes in and he's a witness to the one true God of eternity. For eternity's past, there's not this bloodthirsty God, and then all of a sudden on the cross, everything for eternity will be a different trajectory. No, it's God. It's always been God. And when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And why did I do this? It's because you showed your faithfulness. It's because you did what I asked you to do. Verse 7, the Lord did not see, I'm sorry, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. The Lord brought you out of my by a mighty hand and, a, and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. I did this because I love you. I did this because I promised I would do it. I said I would do it, and I told your grandparents I would do this. I didn't do this because you showed some twinkling, this, this diamond in the rough, and I, I noticed you. I said, oh my goodness, look at them over there. I'll save them. No, I did it because I, because of who I am, not because of who you are, because I love a continuous love. I will redeem you tonight. Now, what's interesting as well is that when they were given the ceremony of the firstborn, it was to always remind them of what God did in the past. How God reminded, wanted them to always never forget what I've done to you. How many, how many of you have forgotten what your wife looked like on your wedding day? How many of you have forgotten what your husband looked like on your wedding day? Do you still remember what they smelled like on their wedding day? Do you remember any small things just, just stood out to you? I remember the way your hair, when that wind, you remember that when the wind blew, when we were saying our vows, you remember that? I couldn't forget it. I'll never forget. I'll never forget that you chose me. I'll never forget that at every moment of the day, every day, you could walk away and you stay. How many of us have forgotten the time we gave our life to Jesus Christ? Revelation talks about that. Remember your first love. Do you remember? Do you remember? Because how this applies to us is that each one of us, just like the firstborn, has been redeemed by the Lamb. We have been redeemed by the Lamb. And we don't enter into this covenant relationship with God by circumcision. Oh, no, no, no. We enter into this covenant relationship with Him by not only giving our lives to Him, but getting baptized, by dying to self and being raised in newness of life. We enter into this marriage relationship, a choice, a free choice, that, not, that you freely gave your life for me, I freely give my life to you right now right now to be used for a holy purpose. That means that when you go to work, Eddie, you don't fly. You don't bring people from Texas to Los Angeles. You're a pilot to bring people to Jesus Christ. And he will see people I will never see. Each one of us has positions and places of work and places of influence where we are ever, making money is peripheral. Providing for our families is peripheral. Do you realize that any time you worry, it is a sign of unbelief and your lack of trust in God that, God, that somehow this may be too big for God, that God is not big enough to fix this, whether it's my job, whether it's my family, whether it's my health, whatever it may be, if I show even an ounce of worry or doubt or fear or if I'm scared, it shows that I don't believe my God's big enough to take care of me through what I'm going through. And that's why when God says, listen, you're going to walk out the front door of Egypt. It was utter disbelief. They'll, they'll never let us go. Well, you haven't seen what I'm capable of yet. 
Have you seen what God is capable of to deliver? Because while they were delivered at a point, and then they lived the rest of their life in freedom, we were delivered when we gave our lives to Jesus, and now we have this voucher called the Holy Spirit, so that when Jesus Christ comes, we look forward to a future deliverance from this earth. When I look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that is real fire, brothers and sisters. That is not spiritual fire. That's not spiritual tribulation. That is a fire that they walked into. So we can, we can theologize about how when you go through spiritual warfare and you go through the fires that God will stand with you, and that's all true. But that was real fire. That was real fire. And what happened over to California just the other day was real guns. And those were real bullets. But do I believe that the God who stood with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will stand with me in hospitals, will stand with me in grocery stores, will stand with me in malls, will stand with me where at gas stations, wherever I am? Do I believe that God stands with me? Because at the, at the end of the day, how many other people burned in a furnace and God stood with them? As far as I know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the only three guys who have withstood the furnace. As far as I know, John the Revelator is the only guy who's been dipped in boiling hot oil and survived. As far as I know, Daniel's the only one that went into a lion's den and came out the other day. So for each one of us, there's this element of, I believe he can, but I'm playing the odds here. I don't know if he will for me. And you know what that means? We need to get on our knees. And we need to pray that no matter what we go through, whether we're standing, can you imagine being in that Boston Marathon? I don't care what you got strapped to you and who I'm standing next to. I believe Jesus is standing with me because Jesus was with Stephen. And Stephen and Jesus was with Paul. Both Stephen and Paul had some things thrown at them. Isn't it interesting, though, that the one who condemned Stephen to death was the one that God saved from those things being thrown at him? Why? Paul never forgot that moment. The moment everything changed in his life. And Stephen played a monster role in that. You and I, you and I, in some way, shape, or form, are claiming today to have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That means we are allowing him to be our substitute. We are claiming the blood of Jesus, the blood of the cross. We've claimed forgiveness. We've given our lives to him, and we do that because we want to be redeemed. We want, don't we want to go to heaven? I want my children in heaven. But in so doing, in so doing, I am entering in to a new phase of life. A life in which I no longer work for self or self-gain. The whole entire purpose of my existence, I want you to think of this. Go in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, we'll start in verse 4. And we'll end here with this with this analogy. Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Seven is a complete number. There's seven spirits, and we'll get into that actually, but seven is a complete number. Just remember that. Grace to you and peace. Do you realize you can't have peace unless there's grace first? You can't have peace and then grace. It has to be grace, the grace of God, be, then as a result of God's grace, we have peace. From him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. This love that is described here is a continuous love. It's a love that does not stop. It, there's no ending to this love. It's always, I always love, and that's reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 7, where I did this because I love you. I continuously love you, and you were released, you, and who released us from our sins. That word released is not a continual release. It is a moment, a point in time when God released. And when in that moment of time did God release? On the cross, he released. And all those by faith who put their trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are therefore released as well. In that moment, he released all those who come to him from sin. 
by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. Do you realize who had access to the Father? The priest did. Do you realize who you now have access to? You're called priest. That means you have direct access to God through prayer. Through prayer, you can call upon God. You are now a priest. You, we are all a priesthood. Why? Because we've been redeemed. There's been an exchange that has taken place where Jesus for us, and now we live a new life. Why? We live a life redeemed, filled with joy. That means when we go to work, we live a redeemed life at work. When we go grocery shopping, we grocery shop in a redeemed manner. When we go to Walmart, when we go to, I bought tires yesterday. And when I go in there, they said, do you want an alignment? I said, well, I can't afford 85 bucks for alignment. No. They said, I said, just check and see if I need an alignment. I was going to try to take it somewhere else I could afford it. So I go in there, and I didn't call back right away, and they said, they're done. I go in there. You know what they did? They aligned my tires. 85 bucks, they aligned my tires. I said, you know what? What, what can I give you? They, I'm telling them, I want to give you more. I know you said you did this for free, but round it up so I can give you some more. And it was taking too long. I said, I'll just bring a gift card to the guy who did this for free. He didn't have to. He wasn't trying to milk me for money. He did it. And you know what? I want to repay him. And you know what Jesus did for us? And how do we repay him? On my way to York Springs this morning, I'm driving by people, and they're all wearing these orange hats and these orange vests. You know what they're doing? They're going out hunting. You know what that means they're going to be doing? Right now, they're sitting in a tree or sitting somewhere waiting for a deer to walk by them so they can shoot them. You know how much patience you have to have to wait for that? You ever played Hungry, Hungry Hippo? I love Hungry, Hungry Hippo. That is the most stressed out, intense, self-destructing, hair-pulling game. There's nothing patient about that game. Jesus Christ is about to come. And we're walking a balancing act. Why? Because we can't force people to make a decision for Jesus. But then when, we, when they're not making a decision, we think the, that's the birds that have come and taken the seed off the rocky, hard path, and they don't, they don't want to be with Jesus. They, they're off to Satan. There has to be a patience. But also, Jesus is coming. There needs to be an urgency of trying to get as many people as we possibly can into the kingdom. We pray for urgency, but we're also the ministers with a holy purpose wherever we go to tell people Jesus Christ is coming, he loves you so much. He will deliver, redeem you. Dad, he's going to take you to heaven. He's going to take us to heaven. He'll take all those to heaven who claim the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may we be that priesthood. God, you came down and did for us, not because of something you saw in us, but because you love us not because we showed such great faithfulness and obedience and we showed gumption and we had, and we had, oh my goodness, we didn't have anything. But you're faithful, you're merciful, you're compassionate, you're strong. And God, you're victorious. You are victorious. You have gained the victory. You have gained our salvation on the cross. And we share in that victory, we share in that salvation when we put our faith in you and what you've done. God, the Bible says some pretty profound things. But then I got to believe that you can back those things up, that you are a big enough God to back up what you say you're going to do. God, come into our hearts. May we look to Jesus. May we look to you. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son.